Hirsch, who will conclude his series on entanglement and gravity. Okay, thank you. So, up until now, we've uh, reviewed ADS CFT and entanglement, and we've understood uh, some interesting connections between the entanglement structure of the CFT states and uh, the geometrical structure of the space times dual to these states. And so if this is true, then a natural question becomes whether we can understand space-time dynamics, or some aspects of space-time dynamics, in other words, gravitation, from some physics related to entanglement. Can we understand? So what I want to do is um, consider some conformal field theory, which we assume to satisfy this Ryu Takianagi conjecture. So, so consider a CFT for which entanglement entropies computed by, so I'll review that. So the statement was that if we are in a state psi of the CFT and we want to compute the entanglement entropy for some region A, then according to the conjecture, there's some dual geometry associated with this state. It's an asymptotically ADS geometry with boundary geometry the same as the geometry that the field theory lives on. So we can write a corresponding region A on this boundary. And then we can find an extremal surface, A tilde, in the bulk, which is homologous to A. That was our, our extra refinement last time. And so the statement is that um, for these theories, the entanglement entropy in this state would be given by the area of that corresponding surface over 4 times the Newton constant. OK. So our approach today is going to be to so assume that we have some theory such that entanglement entropies are computed geometrically like that. And we're going to use certain properties that entanglement entropies have to satisfy. Okay. So entanglement entropies satisfy various fundamental constraints. We've mentioned a couple of them so far. So for example, this subadditivity constraint that says S of A union B plus or minus uh, S of A minus S of B is greater than or equal to zero. That's an example of such a constraint, okay, which is relatively easy to prove. Uh, but there are other ones. There, there's a whole list of constraints that follow um, Basically, from um, linear algebra, there's some properties of matrices. Um, and so the idea is um, if there's some geometry which is actually dual to one of these states, and you compute the entanglement entropies via that geometry, well, they better satisfy these constraints. And if you start, if you write down a geometry and compute entanglement entropies and they don't satisfy these constraints, 
then that geometry is not physical. Okay, you can't, you can't violate quantum mechanics. Okay. So the question is, what do these, in general, what do these constraints imply about the dual space-time geometry? So I'm going to start by talking about uh, constraints that hold if you perturb away from ADS. So it's just at a perturbative level um, or, or perturbing away from the vacuum state of the conformal field theory. And then by the end, I'll talk about more general constraints that hold for any states. Okay, so we start with small perturbations to vacuum state of the CFT. And so I'm going to derive a constraint on the entanglement entropy for subregions um, under such a perturbation. Okay, so we recall. that the entanglement entropy for some region A was defined to be trace of rho A log rho A, where rho A is the reduced density matrix for the region. Okay. And now we consider, so starting with the vacuum state, we consider making a perturbation. And so the density matrix rho gets perturbed, and we could take this formula and compute the variation. And what you find is that the change in the entanglement entropy for the region A is, so you vary this part, you get delta rho A log rho A. And then actually the other term vanishes. Um, if you vary this part, um, you end up with just the trace of delta rho. But rho is a matrix which is always trace 1. So the other term disappears. Okay. So we have, we have this basic relation. Okay. And now I'm going to introduce a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, language. So we call or we define the negative of this particular operator here. So uh, minus log rho, and we define that to be the modular Hamiltonian. So it's not really, doesn't usually have anything to do with the ordinary Hamiltonian um, we're just giving a name to this log of the density matrix that appears in this formula. Okay, so this is the unperturbed density matrix. Okay, so if we, if we start in the vacuum state and we compute the density matrix for the region, then the modular Hamiltonian would just be the log, the minus the log of that density matrix. So using that definition, we can rewrite this basic formula. And you end up with this statement that says that the change in the entanglement entropy for that region under the perturbation is equal to the change in the expectation value of this modular Hamiltonian. So this is a useful formula. I mean, it's true in general. This is true for any quantum system. It doesn't have to be a field theory or anything. Any quantum system, any subset of degrees of freedom, this is, this is a true statement. Um, it's most useful when we actually uh, know what the density matrix in the unperturbed state is. Okay. So it's useful 
if we know rho a. Yes, yeah, so this is the unperturbed, so, so we define an operator based on the unperturbed state. And then we just figure out how the expectation value of that operator changes. Okay. That's the expectation value in the vacuum state? So the delta refers to, so, so this is HA um, 0 plus delta phi minus H A back. So the H A is the same, but the state is different. Okay. So one example where we where we know the density matrix would be if we're talking about uh, a system that's weakly coupled to a heat bath. So the density matrix is thermal. A and right, so the usual okay, the usual canonical ensemble density matrix. And if we plug this in to our general formula, this tells us that delta, so the change in the entanglement entropy under any perturbation to the quantum state is equal to 1 over t times the change in the energy expectation value. So this is, in, in this thermal case, the modular Hamiltonian is just the actual Hamiltonian for that subsystem times 1 over t. And so what you end up with is, from this, is some exact quantum version of the first law of thermodynamics. So this is interesting because most typically when we think about the first law, we think about varying from a thermal state to some other equilibrium state. And this side would be ordinary entropy, which can normally be defined uh, in the case of equilibrium. Yeah? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So the Z uh, disappears when you do the variation. Um, so yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. Which which formula? So it doesn't matter if if I take the the log of this, I could have a constant term. But then if I vary. Oh, and the the definition of h. Um, I think this is the usual definition. Okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm 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 missing which 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 formula are, are, is is probably this one. Ah, well, the, I mean, this is the density matrix. Mark, in your definition of what the modular Hamiltonian is, yes, rho is e to the minus h, not necessarily traceless. So okay. yeah, this is okay. Okay, okay. So I'm sorry. This is not the same as this. Okay. So H mod. Okay. So this this is supposed. This is not the same as this. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. That the I see the. Okay. Good. So this this is the ordinary Hamiltonian. Okay. And using this definition, you will find that the modular Hamiltonian is equal to the ordinary Hamiltonian over the temperature plus some, nor plus some additive thing, um, which doesn't depend on the state and which cancels out here. OK, sorry. Thanks for the clarification. So what, when I change, what, what are you worried about? The uh, a fluctuation term coming from uh, log of uh, rho a. Is that, no, there is a term 
So we're just changing, we're just changing this. When we're, when we're taking this density matrix, this doesn't change. Yes, very good. And uh, when you calculate delta if A, you have the fluctuation term only for uh, rho A. Yeah, so what I said before was that if you vary this part, you get a term that says trace of delta rho, but density matrices are trace 1, and so trace of delta rho should have to be 0. Okay, so, th so this is the formula. This is called the canonical ensemble. So, right, if, if you're. Uh, if okay, so in, in this example, I'm taking the subsystem A to be the system that we imagine is weakly coupled to a heat bath when we're talking about thermodynamics. Okay, so in this case, the density matrix for that system coupled to the heat bath, so a density matrix for a system at finite temperature, is equal to this. This is just the statement that the various states are present with probabilities given by the Boltzmann weights. This is which is the whole which is the whole thermodynamic system, but not the heat bath. Got it. I could draw a picture. Okay. So here's the heat bath. Okay. So that so I'm just taking this, and and the reason and, and we can kind of ignore terms that couple the systems. Okay. So 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 here it's here it's uh, if I computed the if I computed the entanglement entropy um, before doing the perturbation that would be the ordinary thermodynamic entropy. And the usual first law says that if I vary to some nearby equilibrium state, then the change in the ordinary entropy would be equal to 1 over T times the change in the energy. And this is saying that even if I vary to a nearby quantum state, and any, any old uh, mixed state of my quantum theory, that if I compute the change in the entanglement entropy, which I could do regardless of any assumptions about equilibrium, then that change in that is equal to the change in the quantum expectation value of the energy operator for that subsystem. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, good. Okay, so this, but this is basically the example that we're going to use. So, I'm now going to specialize, everything that there was completely general, I'm now going to specialize to uh, conformal field theory. And we're going to start out in the vacuum state, and A is going to be a ball-shaped region. Because if you remember from last time, a ball-shaped region is a region which is conformally, or the, the, um, the causal completion of a ball-shaped region is, uh, so this is, this is A. This part uh, of Minkowski space, where this is time, is conformally related to a Rindler wedge of Minkowski space. Okay. And so last time we computed that the density matrix for the Rindler wedge takes that form, it's the, it takes the form of a thermal density matrix with respect to the Rindler Hamiltonian, which is the boost generator the generator of, of this um, time that flows within the Rindler wedge. Okay, so using uh, using now the fact that we're talking about a conformal field theory, okay. 
And the fact that the vacuum state is invariant under these conformal transformations, okay. well then we could, we could figure out what the density matrix for this ball-shaped region is by using our knowledge of the density matrix for this region. Okay. And so all we need to do is figure out what, the, what this um, time evolution, what this um, symmetry operation is when you map it over using the conformal transformation to this region here. And uh, it's, it's easy to do that explicitly. Okay, so the answer is, okay, so you get, this, you get the same answer except now H is the generator of these time translations that you obtain by mapping these time translations with the conformal transformation. Okay, so this is, this is generator. I'll call it C evolution. And you can write down explicitly what that, so, so first you can figure out what, what that is just as, a, as, an, as it acts on the coordinates. And then you write down the, the quantum operator. You probably can't see that, I'll write it up here. So we write down the, the quantum operator associated with that dx. Okay, so this is basically this this step is basically like the step where you go from so so if you if you want to know the quantum operator associated with time translations, um, you just use Noether's theorem and and um, end up with. the charge associated with this operation. And, and simil it's, it's similar here. This is some conformal killing vector, and this is the charge associated with that. OK. So this is, this is exactly what we would like um, in order to make use of our, our first law type formula. OK. We saw that. If we can actually write down an explicit expression for the density matrix, then you get um, a nice form for that first law. And in this case, okay, so our, our first law Okay, so so our first law was delta S equals delta H, where H is the modular Hamiltonian. And here that's just going to be two pi times H. Um, up to some constant which will vanish when we do the variation. Yes? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, very good. So, um, yeah, so when you have the ordinary Hamiltonian in a field theory that you just integrate over the whole space, stress energy tensor. And here, this is a similar kind of formula, um, except that. In this case, if, if you actually look at, so you, 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 have, to, you have to look at um, what the coordinate transformation gives you, um, the time, so, so if, you, if you go forward a little bit uh, along this time, then the ordinary time changes more in the middle and changes less out towards the boundary. Okay, so this kind of evolution is one where instead of just having the integral over t0, 0, which would be the energy as, uh, associated with that region, you have this weighting factor which vanishes out at the boundary. Okay, so r is the radius of the ball, and little r is, is just the coordinate in your integral. Okay. Yeah, keep asking the, the clarification questions. And little r runs from zero to big R. Right. So, putting it all together, we get this result okay. 
Okay, we get this result that was derived originally by Blanco, Cassini, Hung, and Myers. And it says that for any conformal field theory, we're not yet talking about holographic conformal field theories. This is any, any conformal field theory in any dimension. If you consider a ball-shaped region A, and you start in the vacuum state, and you vary the state to some nearby state, that the change in the entanglement entropy for that region is not, um, well, it's, it's directly related to the change in the energy density inside that ball by this integral formula. Okay. And in particular, everything here is finite if you're, if you're talking about a well-behaved perturbation. Okay. So you don't have to, it's the variation, it's the, the variation of the stress energy tensor that comes in. So you're, any kind of vacuum um, stress energy tensor divergences would, would uh, cancel. And similarly, it's a variation of the entanglement entropy. So this problem uh, that, that you have divergences um, for the entanglement entropy, again, it, it doesn't come into this, or, or that divergence would cancel out when you take the variation. Any other questions before I go on? Yes. Um, so maybe I just missed the problem, but when you first wrote down the modular Hamiltonian, you said something about that we should, this isn't what we normally think of as a, as a Hamiltonian, but now you are relating it more like directly to it. Yeah, well, the ordinary Hamiltonian would be this. And then this is something um, which, in this special case where we're looking at a ball shaped region in the conformal field theory, it actually does generate a certain definition of time. So it d does generate a, a certain notion of time translation within the causal development of this ball. Um, more generally, if I took a region that wasn't ball-shaped, then I would not expect to have such a simple formula. for it. So this density operator uh, would not necessarily be any integral of a local operator over the region. Um, in general, it could be just a very complicated operator with support in that region. No, no, I mean, I, 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 th I think the expectation is that you cannot write it as an integral over, over any local operator. Okay. okay, that it would just be a very um, complicated operator. Yes? Uh, just a question about the finiteness of this uh, yes. formula in the book. Um, yesterday we talked about uh, vacuum uh, within a certain sub-region compared to the vacuum in the whole region. We concluded that uh, near the boundary, uh, the difference of the momentum tensor, if you take the value of that, actually diverges. So suppose um, you would look at the full shape region, um, then reduce <coughs> density matrix of vacuum with horizontal the thermal state. Mm -hmm. If you would compare that to the vacuum, the typical vacuum in the full shape region, Okay, let, yeah, let me clarify that. So, so yesterday we were talking about the difference between, say, the Minkowski vacuum and a state where you had no entanglement between the two sides. And that's a huge, that's not a small variation. So that would be, that would be, you know, very severe kind of variation. Here we're starting from Minkowski space and they're just changing the state a little bit. Okay, so, um, so whatever, um, whatever kind of probably short distance entanglement structure that you had originally is going to be preserved. Okay. Okay, so now we want to specialize to a holographic conformal field theory. So a conformal field theory that satisfies our, our basic assumption that I'll, I'll, I'll restate. So actually, I'll, I'll state a weaker assumption. So for the rest of the talk, all I need is this, is this kind of weaker assumption. So suppose we find a uh, conformal field theory, and we're going to assume that for some family of states,
psi near the vacuum that there exists a dual geometry such that that geometry computes the entanglement entropies. Okay. And so because we're just considering a perturbative, uh, a perturbation of the vacuum, we would expect that these dual geometries are going to be ADF space um, plus some perturbation to the metric. And in cases where we need to write down explicit formulas, I will, I will be using this Pfefferman-Gram form So by a choice of gauge, I can represent these perturbed metrics like this, where this function capital H encodes the perturbation to the metric. Okay, so H equals zero gives you pure, pure ADS, and in general, H is going to be something um, we're going to be working to first order in this H. Okay. How do you know that this state perturbation is only, can be codified only in the metric and not in other, in a scalar field or something? I'm not, uh, I'm not assuming, I'm not uh, necessarily assuming that, um, that nothing else is involved. Um, all, all we're doing is um, saying that there is still going to be some metric and that this is the metric. Okay, so in general, um, in general, especially when we go to finite perturbations, there could be lots of fields involved, but the entanglement entropy is still just computed from the metric, and so that's all I need to write down explicitly. So, so specifically what I want to do is consider a one parameter family of states and I will be working, I will be basically making statements about the, the order lambda term in this, in this family. So, yeah, so, so if I expand this it would be vacuum plus lambda I'm psi one. Let's see. So, um, I don't think I need to make any, so, so for this formula to be true, I don't think I need to make any assumptions about uh, sort of perturbations being localized. The region is localized, and so in some sense it doesn't care what's happening out at infinity. So I don't think I need to make any further assumptions. Yeah. Yes. So maybe I would say what you deform is the, the, the CFT dual. No, no, no. If I had, so th this is important. So if I allowed the metric to change um, at, so if I, if I remove this, okay, and I allow uh, a perturbation which has a finite limit as z goes to zero, then I would be changing the theory. Okay. But in this case, the metric on the boundary is always Minkowski space. And by, um, um, so, so if, if we have a state, if we have a, a, a metric that corresponds to uh, a change in the state but not the theory, um, that's why the perturbation is showing up at uh, some higher order in z. Okay, so, so this, um, you know, in, f in fact, we can, 
we can show, OK, so, so we don't even need to assume this. We, we, we would be able to conclude that, um, that the, the metric perturbation for some finite perturbation of the state where this is finite, we would actually be able to show that the h has to be suppressed by some power of, of z here. But um, I put this in for convenience just to uh, emphasize that when you, you, when you have a variation of the geometry which doesn't affect the theory, um, it's only going to show up at some higher order in the pfefferman gram expansion. Pardon? Yeah, ag again, this is something that we can, we can derive. Um, but this is, this is what I mentioned in the first lecture, that if you, if you solve the um, perturbative equations for um, either the metric or some other field, what you find is that the general solution it has, um, you, you can specify some boundary information at leading order, or at you know, order z to the 0, which corresponds to changing the, um, changing the actual theory. And then the next thing that you get to specify when determining your solution is at this order. So it, it follows from the equations. But I, I guess here I, I, I'm really writing this down for convenience. And we would be able to show ultimately using uh, the finiteness of, of this side that h, cannot, uh, that h must have a finite limit as, uh, as it goes to 0. So, we're as, so we assume that for a family of states psi, um, we're assuming that there's some family of states such that there's a dual geometry. I mean, in some CFTs, there, there, there would be there could be more than one dual geometry. Okay. Well, let's come back to it. Let's come back to it. Yeah, so I mean, the way I'm thinking about it is suppose there is, suppose we have a state and there is a dual geometry. So that's why I, that's why I, I wrote down the assumption. And the goal is going to be set to place constraints on what that geometry could be. Okay, or specifically, um, we could say what does um, delta S equals delta um, Hj tell us about h, or sorry, about, about h mu. Okay. So yeah, I mean, if, you're, if you have a theory that doesn't have a gravity dual, or if your state doesn't have a gravity dual, it doesn't tell you anything. But if it does, let's see what it tells us. Okay, so actually I'll, okay, so we'll, we'll actually get to this point about the power. Um, so one of the interesting things um, is that we can kind of re-derive this connection between the expectation value of the stress tensor and the asymptotic behavior of the metric that I stated in the first lecture. Uh, this turns out to follow from this basic relation. And the idea is to consider first the constraints that come from considering a small ball shaped region in the limit where the size of the ball is zero. Okay. And then in the, in the dual, okay, we could see that um, this is going to be, when we calculate the change in the entanglement entropy, this is going to be related to uh, the area of some very small extremal surface um, Or, okay, so small being infinite, but small if there were, if there were a cutoff. Um, some extremal surface which is localized near the boundary. Okay, and so let's see explicitly. So if we have delta EB um, of R for R goes to zero, that has to be equal to delta SB. For R goes to zero, so we're going to 
we're going to take this expression, sometimes I'll call this delta E for, for short, and then that's going to, you know, using our assumption, be equal to the change in the area of the surface B tilde in the small r limit. Okay, so now delta, okay, so let's, let's think about this part of the formula, the left side of the formula. Um, if we take the, so, so T is some function and we're integrating that against this weighting function on a ball which gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so the answer is really only going to depend on the stress energy tensor at the point in the middle of the ball. Okay. If you work it out, basically you end up with some power of R times delta T. Okay, so Uh, in sure, yeah, I mean, in what, what, right, so the temperature, the temperature could be 2 pi. Okay. I'm, yeah, so for short, I'm just going to call this right-hand side delta E. Yeah, just so we can save space. Yes. Very good. Okay. So, yeah. So, so my left hand side here is going to give me something which is a power of r times. Uh, there's the, okay. So there's some constant times the power of r times the uh, variation of the stress tensor at that point. Okay. And the right hand side is going to be something um, that is computed from the metric out at the boundary. Okay, and so this is the point where if we had uh, an H which did not vanish so rapidly, so, so if we chose some other power of Z which is smaller here, okay, then you would find that this thing here had a different power of R, okay, and it wouldn't work. So in order to have something which is uh, not infinite and not zero, or not, you know, have something which is the same power of R, on this side, it must be that the metric perturbation is exactly um, falling off this fast where H is assumed to go to a constant, okay? So that's where we could derive that. And specifically, we find that it's equal to this combination. So you have to, you have to, okay, this is an exercise to figure out um, to figure out what, um, what the area, what the, what the change in the area of that surface is. So actually one, one point here is that when I vary the geometry, okay, to leading order in H, and I want to figure out the change in this area, okay, because the surface was extremal to start with, okay, then we don't need to take um, so, you know, at, a, at a, an extremal surface, if, if you consider the variation um, of the action, the first order variation of the action is going to be zero, okay? So when we're, we're, when we're considering this change in area um, of the surface, actually all we need to do, um, it reduces just to an integral over the original surface of something involving the metric perturbation, okay? So it's much easier if you go to higher orders, then it's a much harder problem to compute the variation of the area of an extremal surface. But to leading order, you can keep the surface fixed and then you just integrate um, something involving the metric over, over the surface. Okay, so that's why I end up just with something like H. Okay, so I have the, 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 the and there's trace. R to the N. This is the trace. I'm assuming these indices are summed. These are spatial indices um, perpendicular uh, or in, in boundary spatial directions. Um, I can write that in a more suggestive form. Let's see. 
Okay. I'm, there, there are, there are, I'm not being too careful with constants. So these Cs are different. The G Newton is coming in and various volumes of spheres and two pi's, et cetera. Um, so this, this is H0, 0 minus H mu. Okay. So this is obviously not a very covariant formula. It has explicit T's all over the place because we applied the constraint for a region in some spatial slicing, some particular slicing. We could have worked in any other frame of reference and applied the same constraint. Okay, so this constraint built in, there's some frame of reference, but we could work in another frame of reference and apply the same constraint. So you actually get constraints um, for all the different frames of reference. And so what that means is, um, okay, well, we could just, let me, let me re-express this. So we could say that um, we worked in a frame uh, associated with some velocity vector u, which is one, so the, the frame of an observer with this velocity vector, which is zero in all the spatial directions, and then they just have the time. Um, so let me re-express what we said there. Okay. So in a more covariant language, what we showed was that Okay, so this is the same thing in the covariant language, okay? And then in this form, we, we, um, it has to be true for any choice of u. Okay. And so if that's true, then you find that delta t mu nu is equal to c times h mu nu. And actually initially there's some other term with eta mu nu and another constant times h alpha alpha, but if you, uh, if you take the trace of this whole expression okay, and use the fact that the stress energy tensor expectation value in a conformal field theory on Minkowski space has to vanish, um, you find that, you can sit that h alpha alpha also has to vanish. Okay, so that's that's something that's true about the asymptotic behavior of the metric because of the conformal invariance of the theory. So I don't really need to include that extra term. And had we kept track of all of the two pi's and g newtons and l ADSs, um, we would find exactly the same relation that I wrote down um, in my first lecture. Okay. Any questions? The correct C is, uh, okay, so it involves the dimension and some pi's and then um, there's some Planck constant and there's some LADS. Uh, I, okay. I, I'm not going to try to write it down. Yeah. I could, oh, it, okay. One of the students maybe has it written down. Okay. okay. You know, use dimensional analysis to start and and then look up what the pi's are. Okay, so that's, that's going to be useful for the next step. Okay, so it's interesting that we're, you know, as I said, we're, we're just, this is the only thing we're assuming. I'm not actually going to use any other part of the ADS-CFT dictionary in the, in the derivation. So we derived this useful thing um, that, uh, that we will now use uh, for the next step. Okay. And the next step is to consider the constraints that come from general balls of finite size. Um, let's see, are there any you know I, I don't think you, so, you, so let, let me mention one thing, right? Um, here I'm using here I'm using this 
particular Ryu Takenagi formula. Um, in some theories, wh which ultimately are dual to not Einstein gravity, but some higher derivative gravity theories, you have a modified formula here. Okay. Um, in those theories, this result is also modified. And there were examples where it was not known what the correct version of this was. It was not known. You, know, you write down some general Lagrangian for gravity in the bulk. And it was not known by the standard techniques how to um, compute the expectation value of the stress tensor in the CFT. And uh, people have, uh, have applied this argument to derive some new results. So I, I think you know, in, in cases where you might have um, all sorts of Riemann tensors that could have the same symmetry structure, um, then you wouldn't be able to guess it. Yeah. Yeah, no, but, but the, the coefficient here, I, I mean, so, so the right-hand side, um, the right-hand side can, can be different depending on which, which higher derivative terms you have. Oh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't say it was not well-defined. I just said that, so the question was whether you could just guess the result completely based on symmetries. And the answer was that in some, in some higher derivative theories, you can't guess it based on symmetries because you could have all sorts of other tensors appearing. You could, yeah, you could simply, you could write down all possible tensor structures, but, um, yeah, but I think it is, a, it is a useful, it is a useful method. Okay, okay so general, okay, so we've, we've found constraints on these dual geometries coming from looking at small, applying our first law to small balls. And the constraints on the dual geometry were that if your if your dual geometry um, that your the asympt in the asymptotic um, limit of your dual geometry, the metric has to match with the CFT stress sensor. Okay, and now for general balls, B. Okay, so again, you can write this down. Uh, I think I erased this basic formula, so I'll write it again. D D X R squared minus. Okay. So actually, equipped with this, we can now translate this general statement into an entirely geometrical constraint. Okay. So to translate the left-hand side, we use our basic assumption. And then to translate the right-hand side, all we need to use is the formula relating the CFT stress tensor to the asymptotic metric. Okay. So we get R and then our constant and H zero zero. Okay? So basically a statement that the integral over so so again when we compute the variation of that it reduces to an integral over the extremal surface, the unperturbed surface involving the metric, and I'll write it down in a moment. So local function of H mu nu. And that must be equal to some, to this, which is some local function of H integrated over this boundary region. Okay. Um, in case you want to see this explicitly, it's R squared HII. And then this, if we want, it, sometimes it's 
I'll write it as HII, uh, but either one of those is the same. Okay, so that would be that would be look, what it looks like explicitly. Um, so it's a bit ugly. Okay, but sort of stepping back um, and drawing the picture. Okay, so it says if you start with this perturbed geometry M, and then I look at any ball-shaped region, and then I look at the associated B tilde in the bulk, that if I integrate, if I do this integral over here, and I do this integral over here, they better be the same. And they're not going to be the same for, for any old geometry. So this is some condition on the set of possible geometries. And it's not just one condition. So given an M, we could choose this ball, or I could choose this ball, or I could choose this ball, this ball. So in fact, if you look at you know, the tips of the balls are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the points in the bulk. So you essentially have one constraint for every single point in ADS. And so that gives you hope that maybe you could reduce this complicated um, set of non-local constraints into a local equation. In the previous formula, HP nu was at z equals zero. Now you are at no, 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 one This one is at evaluated at z equals zero. And then this one, so h is a function of z and x. Yes. And, and this one is evaluated on the surface. But your previous result was only at z equals zero. Yes. So the previous result was only used to calculate this side. And this one dra comes directly from calculating the variation of the area. OK, so, so can we turn this into a local constraint? Any questions from students before I go on? Okay. OK, let me see. OK, so th this turns out to be possible. Um, and it just, it's just a little bit of um, math, which is really ugly the first time you do it. And then you find fancy ways to do it. Um, so I'll tell you the fancy way. OK, so, um, so we have this surface B and the surface B tilde. And I'm going to define uh, sigma to be the region in between. OK, and so the, the claim is that you can find some differential form with the following properties. Okay. So the integral of this form over the boundary surface is going to equal our boundary integral which I'm calling delta EB. The integral over this bulk surface of the same form is going to equal our bulk integral. Okay. And the exterior derivative of this form is going to be an, an expression in which the Einstein tensor makes an appearance. Yeah, good question. So the form that I'm introducing is not defined, is, is not a, a single form um, for all choices of this boundary region. It's going to depend on which boundary region I choose. So it's a, it's a differential form that's defined in this particular region. Chi depends on the metric in that region and um, say the radius of the region and the center point of the region. Okay, so we'll have a different form for each one of these regions. Okay, so so in the in the exterior derivative of the form, um, there's a positive function 
there's the there is the Einstein tensor expanded to leading order in H. And then there's a volume form. Okay. So, so this is all we need. And the, the argument is actually very elegant. So what we start with is the equivalence of those two integrals. And now in terms of the form, this says that the integral of our form over B is equal to the integral over form over B tilde. Okay. Now, um, subtracting the two or putting them both on the same side, this is the same as saying that the integral over the boundary of sigma of chi is equal to zero. So the boundary of sigma is B minus B tilde. And then we use Stokes' theorem to say that the integral over sigma of d chi has to be equal to 0. Okay, So the integral over sigma of f plus of x times the, the Einstein equations here times the volume form uh, have to be equal to 0. Okay, and this has to be true for every <coughs> sigma. Okay, so so this issue that the, the form is not the same, you know, if, if this were the if if this thing were independent of uh, of the region, we could just then immediately conclude that it had to be zero if it has, if, if the integral over all these regions is equal to zero, um, but in this case where the, um, the function here depends on which region you're looking at, it's just a little bit more complicated. It turns out by doing some manipulations, taking some derivatives with respect to the size of the region, you can make uh, all of that dependence go away. And through a three-step argument instead of a one-step argument, you end up showing that delta dt, that this is only going to vanish for all of the possible regions if the Einstein tensor, or the, if the TT component of Einstein's equations perturbed around ADS is equal to zero. Okay, hold. You want to get... So, I mean, then, then you couldn't possibly learn about something deep in the bulk. If, if it were a very small surface and going a little bit beyond, how could you? No, but I, I want to, uh, so, so I'm saying here it's, it's true everywhere. It's true everywhere. It's locally true. Assume, well, you know, I'm not assuming any, you know, I'm not even assuming locality, right? So, so locality has come out of this. It could, be, it could be that there's a differential equation here, and then there's some other non-local thing over here. So you know, we really, we really want to um, derive it without, without any additional assumptions. OK. okay. Um, so of course, this is only the TT component. But we had that same problem before with our previous expression. Um, and the, the resolution is the same. Um, so you know, we used. We used uh, this delta S equals delta E constraint um, in only one frame of reference, the frame associated with U mu equals 1, 0, 0, 0. Um, and in that frame of reference, what we showed is that u mu u nu times delta e u nu is equal to 0. Okay? So now we could do it in any other frame of reference and show the same thing. And the only way for this to be true for every possible time like u is 
for is for delta e mu nu to be equal to zero. Okay. And actually, we're still not quite done because um, these indices are only the indices along the boundary directions. Okay, so we still have delta e mu z and delta e zz um, equals zero. Okay, but actually those equations, it turns out, um, are uh, they're, they're equations such that if, if they're true on the boundary, they're going to be true everywhere, assuming the other equations. So they're constraint equations. Um, and so the, to show the other ones, okay, it's, it suffices, it turns out, to show them on the boundary. And that turns out to follow, again, from basic properties of conformal field theories. Okay. So I have, um, I have, so the tracelessness and conservation of the stress energy tensor in the field theory, if I translate that using our first result to the bulk, I end up with these equations and Turns out that these are exactly what you need on the boundary. On the boundary. On the boundary. Yeah, on the boundary. Um, uh, z equals zero. Z equals zero. Um, so these turn out to give me delta e z mu z equals zero equals zero. And then you use the other equations that you've derived um, to show. Mu equals zero. Yeah, I guess. Uh, oh, it's just yeah. Let's see. Okay. So you are realizing what Jacob wanted to do to get the equations to from For this one, for for this for this component for this. Yeah. Implies, but so. Oh, so this one is at the boundary. Okay, so so there's some equation. First, you show it's true at the boundary, and then it's it's sort of conserved as you go inwards, and so it's true everywhere. Yes. Well, okay. So okay. Pardon? To determine. Ah, oh, I didn't. I didn't show you that. You want to see the form? Okay. The form is okay. The form is ugly. <laughs> Let me tell you a story instead of showing you a form. I'll show you the, f okay, I, I can show you the form. Um, I don't even have it written in my notes, it's ugly. But, um, so, okay, the story is, um, the story is originally we wanted to, we, we, you know, we wanted to turn the non-local thing into a local thing, and um, we thought, okay, we need to find such a form. And we tried to find a form and we didn't find a form. And then we said, okay, let's, take that equation and um, write it out as a power series in the radius of this ball and just match all the power series coefficients and use some kind of induction argument to show that it has to work. Um, okay, so then later, um, actually, le okay, let me, let, me, let, me, um, let me write down a summary first. Okay, um, okay so there's some connection. Okay, so a slight pause in the story. Okay. 
okay, so, so to put everything in context, I'll just summarize the, what we did. That was to start from a, a relation that's true in any CFT to then derive a non-local constraint on the bulk geometries and then to show that this is equivalent to this, okay, using, using this magical form, okay, that originally we, so you, you, originally we didn't have. Um, okay, so after the, after the first pass, um, it was pointed out that this relation here um, is something that has um, an interpretation as a certain black hole law of thermodynamics. Okay, so it involves these hyperbolic black holes that I was that came up yesterday. Um, this particular region of pure ADS satisfies the conditions for uh, a, theor a, a theorem of black hole thermodynamics, a general one, uh, generalized one uh, due to Wald. Um, the condition is that you have some bifurcate killing horizon, but, but this, so this, this region of ADS space, um, if you, if you write it in some coordinates, it's a hyperbol, it's a Schwarzschild hyperbolic black hole with a certain temperature with a horizon, and this is the horizon. Okay, so there is a theorem of Wald that says that if you start with um, pure ADS, and then you perturb it in any way that satisfies the Einstein's equations perturbatively that the change in the area of this black hole horizon is equal to the change in some energy. Okay. Now, with some work, you can show that, that their definition of energy is the same as our definition of energy. Um, so this direction in the implication is something that basically existed in the liter literature. Okay. And, um, and Wald and Iyer had, uh, had come up with some very, very beautiful um, derivation of this direction involving a particular differential form that can be defined for any covariant theory of gravity in the bulk. Okay. And, um, and so it turned out that the form that they were using in, in this direction um, turns out to be exactly the same thing that we, we require. Um, so using, their, using all this technology, you spend a, a few days deciphering one of their formulas and uh, trying to write it. Uh, you know, it's, 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 not a, it's not a five minute thing to, to write what it is explicitly in terms of H, um, starting from their general thing. It's like a three hour thing and then you, you get it and you can check that it, that it works. Explicit. But it's explicit, yeah. If it, you can find it in our paper and, and it's a little bit, you know, it's, we should have been able to find it. You know, it's linear in H, and, and there's some derivatives on it, and, and uh, but. Well, that, so that's, yeah, that's the thing. They, they, were, they were going this way, and it applies to any uh, black hole. So one important point here is that you know, part of what we've done is, is found just a purely gravitational result, which is a converse of one of the black hole uh, thermodynamics laws. It says that if, if this, um, <clears throat> if this is true for this full collection of um, hyperbolic black holes, okay? so, so if this is true for not just one region, but you know, the entire collection and those with, with in, in the arbitrary frames of reference, then you can go backwards and, and derive the, um, the linearized Einstein equation. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to talk about what you can do past that. Okay, so, um, okay, so, so one part of that story. Pardon? Yeah, so, okay, so, so let me, let me, right, so there's, there's some, there's been some arguments in the literature, start, I think maybe starting with Feynman um, and, and then various people later than that, that if you have the linearized gravitational equations um, and that the stress energy tensor is the source um, for those equations, that the only way to sort of consistently upgrade that to a, uh, um, a complete 
covariant theory is to have the nonlinear equations. So actually, so far we don't have well, the or yeah, yeah, so or things that come uh, so some covariant uh, some covariant thing. So so far, uh, let me say that we don't have this this part in the derivation. So far, uh, we haven't seen a source appearing, um, and that's that's related to the fact that so you you have eight pi g newton t mu nu at the classical level. T mu nu is typically quadratic in the field, if you have a scalar field or gauge field. Um, this is not going to come in uh, for a linearized perturbation. Okay. Now it turns out that at the quantum level, um, you can have contributions to T mu nu to, to the uh, to T mu nu, and um, and so actually there, there's a quantum story here because the Ryu Takenagi uh, conjecture has been extended by Faulkner and Lukowitz and Maldacena to include um, one over n corrections. Okay, so this was the statement that instead of just the area, you add on a term at order g, sort of g n to the zero, which is uh, delta s bulk. Okay, so you add on this delta s bulk term, where this is the entanglement entropy of whatever bulk matter fields you have across this, uh, across this surface. Okay. So the nice thing turns out to be that we can compute this. Um, it's an example where, so we, so we can compute this using this first law again. Um, so we have ADS, we have some quantum fields above ADS, so we're, we're thinking of a semi-classical, um, so, so at this order, we're, it's like semi-classical gravity where you have quantum fields on a fixed background. And so then delta S can be related to delta of the expectation value of this modular Hamiltonian. And that it turns out that you can, so, so I, I computed uh, before the modular Hamiltonian for a Rindler wedge of flat space turns out that you can compute it for a Rindler wedge of ADS space as well, okay, using the same arguments. Okay. So this, this comes, uh, this gives you T mu nu bulk. And so if you use the extended formula in all of the steps of the derivation, then on the right hand side here, what you find is 8 pi g newton times the expectation value of TAB, which is the stress energy tensor for the perturbative bulk fields. Okay. So you do actually you do actually see um, you do actually see a source here. So one one way to proceed would be then to apply these arguments to say, well, that that should be the source um, for the Einstein equations um, classically as well, and then apply these old arguments. We're, yeah, so, so to, get that, to get that term, we're using a more refined conjecture that includes the interpretation of the 1 over n terms in entanglement entropy. Um, this this, conject, this, this um, formula existed uh, previously in discussions of black hole thermodynamics. So um, it had been argued previously that uh, for, for black hole thermodynamics to work out correctly, you, you should have... Uh, some contribution to the bulk entanglement. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess if, if, we're, if, we're, if we're going through the derivation, um, I mean, so there's two expansions here. One of them is, is the perturbative expansion in H, and the other one is this expansion in 1 over n. So if I have 1 over n, if, if H now has some 1 over n term, I mean, because what we're doing is linear, I imagine that the 1 over n terms in H, assuming 
that they're there would just go along for the ride and they would just show up. Um, because it's all linear, um, they would just show up on the left-hand side here. So now every time h appears, you know, we're, we're doing a linear thing and now we're adding this 1 over n term. And so I guess you should have h plus 1 over n correction to h here coming in on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, um, you would have this uh, change in the, in the bulk stress tensor, uh, which would, I suppose, include the contributions from perturbative graviton fields. So, yeah, I think that's, I think that's basically how it has to work. Um, Okay, so let, but let me let me say what so this was this was including the one over n corrections, seeing that there's this source here, and then invoking some um, some kind of general arguments, um, which I think assume probably assume things like locality. It probably assumes that uh, you know we start with a linear local equation. You probably to to run those arguments, you're making additional assumptions like locality of, of the non, you know, what, whatever re replaces the, the equations at the nonlinear level. I imagine that um, you could write down some non-local equations which would also generalize the, the linearized equations locally and, and it would probably be, so it would be a weaker kind of argument than what we did to get the linearized equations which, which didn't assume anything like locality and we just, we just got the whole thing. Um, so in, in that spirit, um, we, could, we could try to ask what we could get without making any further assumptions, um, but by applying some constraints on entanglement entropies that hold at the, you know, uh, for finite perturbations. Okay, should be fine. Okay, um, so, so let me me just mention a, f a few different constraints that you have um, that should give you useful constraints on the gravity side. Okay. And one of, them is, one of them is this strong subadditivity that has been mentioned a couple of times so far. So that says that given any three regions or any three subsystems A, B, and C, that S of A union B plus S of B union C is greater than or equal to S of A union B union C plus S of B. So this constraint was shown to follow automatically in any time dependent situation. Um, it, so if, if, you, if you interpret this holographically, if you take any time independent geometry and compute the extremal surfaces corresponding to various regions. Um, Hedrick and Takianagi argued that this always holds. Okay, so it doesn't actually give you any constraints on geometry. But in the time dependent case, um, it does give you useful constraints. And I'll, I'll, mention, those, uh, I'll mention those soon. Uh, so this is one, just, but just on the, on the CFT side, this is one thing that always has to be true. Uh, another thing that always has to be true involves what's called the relative entropy. Okay, so the relative entropy of two density matrices is a measure of distinguishability for two density matrices. And it's defined to be trace of rho log sigma minus trace of rho log rho. And in terms of quantities that we've discussed so far, it's equal to the change, the finite change in the modular Hamiltonian uh, when going from sigma to rho minus the change in the entanglement entropy. Okay, so it's like a finite version of, of, of the, the thing that had to vanish at the infinitesimal level. So we, we had it infinitesimally that delta H has to equal delta S. 
if you do finite perturbations, then this thing doesn't have to vanish. But it turns out it always has to be positive. Okay. So, so delta h minus delta s is greater than or equal to 0. So this is called the positivity of relative entropy. And there's another condition on relative entropy, which, the, which is that if I, if I consider the relative entropy, so this, this difference, if I calculate that for one region and I calculate it for a bigger region, then it has to be larger for the larger region. Okay. So it's also what we call monotonic. as you increase the size of the region. Okay. okay, so these are things that, again, they're just true for any CFT. But in a holographic context, you could take a candidate geometry M, which you think might be dual to some state, and then calculate all these entanglement entropies, or, or delta H's, and just check whether these constraints are satisfied. And if they're not, then the candidate geometry that you have can't be physical. Uh, yeah. Once you have a finite um, perturbation. Yes. And why can't you have a situation where the right hand side is not a specific geometry but a superposition? Good. So you you could, but I, I can still consider states which have a, a good single geometry dual to them, and then ask what are the constraints on those geometries. Okay. So. So a way to think about this is suppose I have a consistent theory of quantum gravity with a good classical limit. Okay. And now imagine that some geometry is allowed in, in that good classical limit. Um, compute all these things holographically and check that they're satisfied. And if they're not, then that, that geometry is not allowed. Okay. And uh, so just to finish, then I'll just mention um, um, some preliminary results. So this, this story uh, is not at all complete, um, but we've, st we've started actually various people, uh, Aguri and, and some collaborators, and Hubini and Ragamani and Takinagi and some collaborators, um, and uh, Sinha and, um, and collaborators, and my apologies to all the people that I just called collaborators uh, without saying their names, especially if they're in this room. Um, have, have started the, a program of, of understanding um, what these things imply. Okay, but ju so just a way to think about them is that we're, we're going to be kind of, rule so here's the space of geometries, and we're, we're going to be, um, you know, finding sort of a physical subspace there. Okay, now one point is that, you know, any geometry satisfies Einstein's equations. If you have some stress energy tensor, you, I mean, you just calculate the left-hand side, and you say, well, this is a solution as long as the stress energy tensor, um, uh, you know, define the stress energy tensor to be the left-hand side. Okay. So a way to interpret these constraints that we're finding, um, assuming that Einstein's equations are satisfied, would be as it's constraints that rule out certain stress energy tensors. Okay. So these constraints are something like. Um, energy conditions. Okay. And in the preliminary uh, work that we've done and other people have done, um, that seems to be what we're finding. Okay. So, so this is a way to potentially uh, derive energy conditions fundamentally. Usually they're just things that are taken to be plausible in general relativity. Um, so, so I'll mention, um, let's see, two results. So one of them is that so you, could you can show that asymptotically, if you're, a, if you're an observer you know, out close to the boundary of ADS, and you're moving um, parallel to that boundary at any velocity, then you will always see positive energy. So that, that would be the, um, a version of the weak energy condition for, um, for people near the boundary. Um, there's a more general condition that we've shown for some very highly symmetric space times, and that comes from using strong subadditivity. Okay, so that that sorry that that positive energy theory uh, theorem came from the the positivity of relative entropy. 
um, this strong subadditivity constraint in the context of some very symmetric space times uh, in, uh, and, and in the context of one plus one dimensional CFTs, um, we've shown that it translates to an averaged version of the null energy condition. Um, so the statement is that if you, if you look at any extremal surface and you construct the, you, you think of some light sheet coming off that surface, so some, some null vectors that are defined along the surface, um, and then you calculate t mu nu times u mu times u nu, um, well, the null energy condition would say that that's always positive, okay? but that's not quite what we have. Um, we have that the integral of this thing over the extremal surface has to be positive. Okay, so we seem to be able to find geometries that violate the null energy condition locally, but which still satisfy these constraints. So it may be that you know, the real condition is stronger than the one we find, or it may be that, um, that, only, that the null energy condition is only true in an average sense. Um, that's something that people have postulated in the past. Okay, so I will stop there. <laughs>